Felisa Villanueva Beard, and I am really excited about this conversation. We have an incredible panel of folks, and we have our guest of honor here, Joel Klein, and I'm just really excited to be able to, to have this conversation. For me, um, I will say that mentorship has been a really important part of my trajectory. Um, one of my, the most important mentors to me is someone I met at 16 years old. Um, some of you may know I grew up in South Texas on the Rio Grande Valley border and this man, Joe Disk, he is the husband of, of was the husband of my biology two teacher and he just took me under his wing. He was this banker, lawyer from Indiana, but now lived in, in McAllen, Texas. And he saw something in me and he's the reason that I ended up at DePaul University in, Midwest, um, in the Midwest. And, and I talk about that part of my life as truly transformational because I grew up in a Mexican-American community um, right on the border and I never would have left the state um, and I never would have gotten way out of my comfort zone um, were it not for Mr. Disk. And I, that is when I learned about who I was. I learned about educational inequities um, through that journey and it changed everything for me. And then Joe Disk supported me unconditionally, just had this, I mean, unyielding support and belief in my potential and it really helped a lot through my first semester in college when I had a really hard time. And then he just became an incredible mentor that I relied on um, and have relied on through my adulthood. And so I know the power of mentorship and it's, it's at its core and it's anchored in love and someone who deeply understands your strengths and helps to support you um, in your hardest moments and is very honest with you when you need honesty um, in, as, you, as you go about your professional development and your personal development. Um, and so I am excited to have a conversation about how do we do this better? How do we build authentic relationships that allow us to accelerate our own growth, both personally and professionally? Um, and what can we learn from that? How do we have the conversation at the level of even um, the power structures that exist? And sometimes I think we need to go there and have the conversation about how sometimes people of color, women, um, don't always seek out mentorship or don't know how to do that or it's harder and don't always have the access. Um, and so I, I'm hoping that we can have a really rich conversation around the various dimensions of this so that we can get our needs met. Um, so we are going to have the conversation with these folks here, but before we jump in, I want to get a sense, and I'm hoping this can also help the panelists, a little bit about what's on your mind. And so I'm going to ask you all three questions, and, and, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand um, if this applies to you. Um, so my first question is, is around the topic of comfort of mentorship. Um, I consistently know how to find great mentors, and this benefits me personally and professionally. Who would affirm that you know how to do this, and this is a benefit to you? Okay. We got to talk about that. All right. Um, I need advice about how to find mentors. Who needs advice on how to find mentors? Access. I feel comfortable building relationships with people who are different from me in terms of race and class and gender. That's pretty good. All right, we're gonna dive in. We get a sense of what's on people's mind here. So um, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna engage in a conversation with these folks um, to the left of Joel who have been really influenced by him. And Joel has been an incredible mentor to actually many people, and you sort of see the handprints of, of Joel everywhere, which is why we were excited to have this conversation with him. So we're gonna have a conversation there. I'm gonna turn then to have a conversation with Joel, and then we'll have a conversation together. We are gonna ask that you send in your questions through the note cards that hopefully were on your chair. Um, and I am going to ask Malika and Nicole to um, pick these up, and they are back there. They're standing up now. So if you have a question, if you could just raise your index card and they're gonna come grab it. They're gonna try to organize them by theme so we can hit on the things that are on your mind. So as we are talking, please write in your questions and they're going to collect them for us. Okay, so I'm gonna talk with Paymon first. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. What I want you to do first, Paymon, is please tell the audience who you are, what you do these days, and what your relationship um, has been with Joel. Sure. 
So I'm Pam Monroe Hanafard. I'm the superintendent of Camden City School District. Camden is a smaller city in the south of New Jersey. It is statistically the poorest city in America and a school district with a lot of challenges. And I've been now serving as superintendent my third year. Uh, I first uh, came across, I guess, uh, in a speech Joel gave when I was a TFA core member and ultimately had the great fortune and privilege to join his administration. I never worked directly with Joel. Uh, there was a very long period of time where I questioned whether he knew my name, uh, in part because it's not an easy name to remember or say. Uh, but he was uh, somebody who uh, I spent approximately two years working with uh, in the New York City Department of Education. That's also how I met Mr. Mark Sternberg to my left. Got it. I want to keep talking to you, Payma. Um, tell us a little, t tell us how you, like, very concretely have benefited from Joel's mentorship. Yeah, and, and so that was obviously the big question for us to respond to, and I think what has benefited me the most is just, like, I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't met Joel. I truly, fundamentally mean that. And, and I'm also being serious in that I wasn't sure if he knew my name for the longest period of time. I didn't report into him. And so what I think is so inspiring, because he has a million different things he could have been doing when he was chancellor, was he advocated for me when I didn't even know he knew my name. He cared for those that were on his team. He cared for those who uh, were going above and beyond. And, and, and that certainly left an impression on me because, again, truly, fundamentally, I wouldn't be in a position to be able to serve it, the, the wonderful people of Camden, New Jersey, had he not opened up doors for me. Can you give us a very concrete example of how he did that? Well, I mean, <laughs> concrete example, the decision maker who ultimately hired me is someone that listens to Joel. Uh, and, 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 and so the circle of advisors uh, in, that, in that whole process uh, were people that very much respect and admire Joel. So just his word goes a long ways. And he also opened up opportunities for people like Mark and John White, who initially hired me in the New York City Department of Education. So because of that uh, relationship he had, I was pulled into New York City Department of Education. Um, so there, there are many kind of layers and generations of the, of the mentorship he's offered. This is, I just want to jump in on this point, because in really what happened, John White, who's somebody I was very close to and mentored closely, he became very close to Paymon. And one of the things I think about mentorship is it doesn't always have to be direct. Mm. It can be intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm so proud of, I mean, the work this man is doing if you don't know about it, learn about it. It's mm -hmm. extraordinary. But what I think is great when you create an environment, we'll get to talk about this, in which people really believe that the people around them are the most important contribution they can make. You create that culture. And so Paymon's real mentor, and the reason he's in Camden, it was John White. And John White is somebody like Mark, who you know I consider like my sons. Mm -hmm. I really do. Hmm. Um, and last question for you, Paymon, is when you think about your own leadership and, you know, no doubt you have a vision of what kind of leader you want to be, how has, how has the mentorship of Joel, and it sounds like John as well, sort of influenced how you yourself think about mentorship, if at all? And I know you're early on in your career, but it'd be great to hear how you think about that at this stage. I don't have a great answer there, to be totally honest with you. I'm still in a place where I am really dependent upon my circle of advisors and mentors to support me than uh, in a place where I'm thinking actively about how I can support others. But I can tell you that I reflect on it a lot. And right now in Camden, we're doing really complicated work in terms of change management. And we think a lot about the effect on our central office and those that uh, were there before we came in and how we can support, nurture, mentor uh, those individuals in Camden who were doing great work before we got there. And there's certain unintended consequences of the work and the impact it's had. And so it's a constant dialogue within our leadership team. And uh, Joel's role, John's role, and Mark's role uh, has certainly influenced my thinking. Great. All right, Mark, we're going to. Can I, can I just, you know. In John, yeah, you can start by introducing in, yourself. In John's absence, I just want to challenge the, the, this notion of the, the history here that John brought you into the Department <laughs> of Education. I mean, you know. Uh, Mark's also a mentor. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, the reality is John did. And, and when, I, when Joel brought me in to tweet, uh, 
you know, John, John and I, you know, we're probably spending 10, 12 hours a day together. And uh, the first thing John told me to do was, was keep Paymon. And I was like, I could not remember the name because it's a funny <laughs> name. And I was like, I got to check this guy down. And it was, it was the first person who, who when John was going was gonna to move away from the work that I was going to take over, uh, was very important to keep, you know, keep on that team for sure. So anyway, sorry. Um, my name is Mark Sternberg. I, um, I currently direct the education program for the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, I was a teacher, then principal, um, and then um, had, the, had the, the great honor to serve as Joel's deputy in New York City um, for his last several years uh, in office and then for the duration of, of Mayor Bloomberg's third term. Can you tell us a little bit I'm going to ask you the same exact yeah, yeah. questions um, of like <laughs> how you benefited from Joel's mentorship. I mean, you yeah. you talked to me about some great stories, so I'd love for you to share a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, Joel Joel was uh, before Joel knew me, and I you know I just need to say like the, you know very powerful for me to sit two seats away and for have you know to to hear Joel talk of me about you know as as you know. Th that he thinks of me as his son, I will have a hard time articulating how important that is to me. So thank you for that, Joel, and, and the feeling is mutual. Uh, but but the reality is, before Joel knew me, he was helping me, and I think that's a, you know a similar theme to the one Paymon has has introduced. Joel, and, and it wasn't about me. It was that Joel, as is now you know well known and well celebrated, although not celebrated enough, walked into the New York City Department of Education and looked out at a sea of failure, a sea of schools that were failing generations of kids year after year, decade after decade, and he said that's not good enough for the city. And he took a school like a Vanderchild's, where I was the founding principal of a small school, he took a school like a Vanderchild's that had served 4,000 students for 50 years, and for 40 of those 50 years had produced a 20% graduation rate and decided to replace that school with, uh, with in, the, in the case of the Evander campus, six new schools. And I was fortunate enough to be the person that Joel and his team selected to be the principal of one of those schools at the age of 29. No gray hair, <laughs> then lots of gray hair now. Um, so I raised my hand, Elisa, when you asked, you know, uh, your first question, which was, I think, are you are you facile at uh, finding mentors? I mean, that's something I do. I collect people, and I, 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 I you know, I just I, I go out of my way to put myself in front of them and ask them the tough questions that I can't answer myself. And and that's what I did with Joel because Joel was on New York One, giving out his email address, and encouraging right. family members and teachers and principals to reach out to him. So I said, you know, what the hell. I'm 29, I'm a new principal, and, and hi, Mr. Chancellor, my name is Mark. And about 45 seconds later, Joel responded. And that was my first year's principal, and I never asked Joel for, you know, to solve a problem that I could ask somebody else to solve. I never, I never, it was never transactional. It was like, this guy is someone I need to spend time with. I need to breathe the air this guy is breathing and understand what motivates him, because if I can do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn. You know, I'm gonna be a better principal. And so I kept emailing him and he kept responding. You know, and he, he would come to the school and spend time with families and, and students and faculty, some of which I'm proud to say are in this room. He would, in, you know, he would, he would spend time with me at Tweed. You know, I would, I would, you know, I don't know, once a quarter show up at Tweed. And I, I, I got a lot out of those sessions. You know, where we would just, you know, sit together for a half an hour or whatever it was. Um, very meaningful time for me. I suspect good for Joel, not because it was me, but because it was good to be, you know, to be thinking about work at the school level. Um, but that was, that was my introduction to Joel Klein. And it was, it was, it was a high return thing for me to do and a, an enormous act of generosity by Joel to, to take me and, and so many others in like that. That's great. Um, I do want to pull out two things that I'm taking from that that I want to come back as we have our broader conversation, which is your 
extreme confidence, which is good, to like think, the chancellor gave me the email. I should email the chancellor. Um, and at 29, Mark knew that that was a very good thing to do, and he and he was and you engaged him in the right strategic way, which I think is really important. I want to come back to this confidence issue um, because I think that's a really important one, and it struck me when we first talked that that mm -hmm. and that, that's and the question becomes how do people do that because that's how you build your networks and it's really important. Can you just say, um, Mark, one thing, you've been a principal, you've had various leadership roles obviously. Mm -hmm. As you sort of think about and reflect on Joel's leadership, how has that influenced your leadership and the way you think about mentorship? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it was a courageous thing to do, I suppose. The, the, like the game changing thing was the email, getting the email back. <laughs> All right, so I, I give Joel the credit here for you know, investing in the people around him in the way that he does effortlessly. Mm. You know, he does it now effortlessly, he did it then effortlessly. And, and I can tell you having sat near him as his deputy, I mean he probably, I don't know Joel, you know, several thousand emails a day. Right, so this guy, you know, this was a priority for him. Um, uh, to your other question, look, the, the, the mentorship went on steroids when I got to Tweed and was Joel's deputy and was, you know, was working with him and doing very hard things on his behalf. And what Joel did then was uh, we had the foundation of you know, a deep trust and, 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 um, and respect, but Joel was uh, merciless, mercilessly honest with me. And he did not hold back. And he told me exactly what I was doing, uh, sometimes when I did it well, but when I did something wrong, I heard from Joel. And those are hard jobs, and every mistake that could be made, I made. And Joel could be counted on uh, you know, to, be, to be candid and frank. And that you know, is what I needed then. It's what we all need in a mentor. And um, yeah, it's certainly something I take with me. It's great. I love that. Direct and candid and how you knew he loved you and was doing it out of full love and belief in you um, and was giving you a gift every day, which I think is really good. Heather, introduce um, yourself. Tell Lisa. us your relationship with Joel. Um, so, hey everyone, my name is Heather Tao Yik. I just transitioned from the founding executive director role in, at Teach for America, Rhode Island, which is also my home state. And I um, worked with Joel as his special assistant, and this was in the first term of the Bloomberg administration, and things were moving very rapidly. There was an old world, there was a new world, and it was just right after the launch of the Children First Reform agenda, um, and leading up to the re-election of Bloomberg's second term. Um, as a special assistant, I had many functions, um, I wore many hats, very specifically, I ensured quality control over Joel's briefings and preparation. I also um, managed uh, the panel for educational policy, which was the replacement for the um, Board of Education that was um, prior to the mayoral control as a structure, governance-wise and policy-wise. Um, and I had a whole list of other job description items, but really uh, what Joel said to me, I think maybe my first week on the job was, your job is just to protect me. Like, mm. that is it, like that's your entire job. And I took that very seriously. Um, not only on the external front, but also on the internal front, there was many demands on his time. As the CEO of the largest public school system in the entire country, I studied and had to quickly learn. I had to put myself in his shoes. I mean, Joel, you're going from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Mm. like out of, the, out of the house, right? And you were still going at home, uh, responding to emails, many from this repeat offender called Mark Sternberg. <laughs> um, and I remember that because I think I got directed some of those emails to figure out how to like navigate the bureaucracy and problem solve around. But um, you were always on. Um, and yet you always made time for people and you always made time for your wife, Nicole. Mm. And I think those are important things. When I think about the overall lessons um, that benefited me directly, one was just studying and having an opportunity to work alongside someone who was making dramatic changes in a system that needed a shock. And I was a teacher in New York City. I um, had worked also alongside teachers as a mentor and coach for several years as well. And I saw the massive inequities that existed among schools, 
um, in the Bronx, Harlem, Washington Heights, and my aunt taught at the Spence School, which was a very high-performing private school. And I would talk to her, and she literally would give me books to, for my classroom, and it was a wrinkle in time, and she taught third grade, and my eighth graders had a really hard time with that book. Um, so we needed massive change. Um, but similar to, um, to Mark, you know, I think Joel had very, very high expectations, and that meant when praise came, it was really powerful. And so I really learned this, this power of praise and how it has to be really situated in the context of both performance, um, high expectations in that regard, and we had a panel uh, meeting where we got a consensus vote on a very controversial fifth grade promotion policy. <laughs> and <laughs> within 10 minutes after Joel was on his way home after the meeting, said four words, thank you, great job. And the power of those four words really just uplifted me after sort of several weeks of very hard work. And it just made it all worthwhile in so many ways. Um, and then secondly, you know, Joel also just, you know, asked about my personal life. He wanted to make sure I was not overworking. And everyone was working really hard because to keep up with the pace of a 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. and beyond schedule, you've got to put in the time and you've got to be ready and you've got to be prepared. So um, that human aspect. Um, and I don't think I thought about this until just now when, Joel, you talked about this intergenerational piece. But I've heard this feedback in, in conversation with others before. But you don't um, always manage everyone in an organization when you're working at scale. And so how do you reach down into an organization of people that you don't directly work with all the time, directly manage, or even interact with on a daily basis? And that is a really important thing to be deliberate about and um, focused on, because I will tell you that I was not someone who felt comfortable um, emailing someone who was someone like Joel at age 29. And I did not feel comfortable um, I don't know if it was comfort or confidence or what, but I think there's this aspect of cultural identity that plays into whether or not you see yourself as an individual or you see yourself as part of a collective. And as a Chinese American woman, I grew up in a very sort of culturally dominant um, family where as a child, you're not meant to be, you know, out of hierarchical um, order, so to speak. Um, and that's not a, a negative thing. I think of it as a blessing. Truly, but um, we have to learn the different ways to interact with uh, other people and culture because I think that relationships really are the currency of power and influence, and if we don't leverage those relationships, then we're missing out on our ability to totally change the status quo. Great, you have brought up so many great topics we're gonna return to. Um, the intergenerational piece, I think we need to talk more about that, and then the cultural aspect of this and how to how to gain that currency and ensure everyone has access to it. Um, but before we do that, I want to spend time talking to Joel here. Um, so Joel, obviously, we want, to, we want you to take us back so that we understand the New York City context that you walked into. And obviously, talent is something you get and has been very central to how you run the show. Um, so can you just start by telling us a little bit and, and setting the stage so we all can follow and understand it? Sure. Well, first of all, let me, this is the weirdest. I do lots of panels. This is the weirdest panel I've ever done <laughs> in my life. Thank you for saying so, that. If anyone wants a dress rehearsal of a funeral, you come do one of these. Okay? <laughs> That's what's going on here right now. All right. Come on. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, I just want to say, what you're doing for Teach for America right now and your leadership, we, every panel I do, I want to acknowledge that because it's really oh. important, and I thank you for it. So let me, let me set the stage because it's actually, I, I, I want to separate out a couple of concepts about mentorship because some of you, you're seeing people here that I've mentored either directly, indirectly, partially, but that was in a context of leadership and organization. Yeah. It's very different, for example, than people I've mentored who come to me and talk to me and I decide this is worth investing my time in this person because I care deeply about her or him. And so there's a different kind of context in which mentorship came up. When I started in 2002, it was like a weird thing. It's a true story. So Mike Bloomberg calls me. He says, you know, I just got control of the schools. I like, and I know him peripherally. He says, I'd like, I'd like you to be, consider being chancellor. So I said, Mike, I said, you know, you must have gotten the wrong name at a Rolodex because 
you know, I, I don't do schools. I mean, I went there, but I don't, it's not like, you know, I was at the time at a German media company called Bertelsmann. So I said, he said, no, 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 you're just what we wanted to, so anyhow. So I took, this was weird to me in the following sense. When I had run the antitrust division for Bill Clinton in the Justice Department, there I, you know, I knew everybody. I could team, put my team together instantaneously. I, I knew the people I wanted as my lawyers, deputies, economists, et cetera, et cetera. Here, I knew nothing. And so two things, and I had, he picked me in basically to start like August 19th, the schools are opening in early September, and if you don't have a team in place, the city will point out to Bloomberg exactly what the critics were wanted to say about me. This guy doesn't know the first damn thing about schools, he couldn't put his team together, et cetera, et cetera. So this is enormous pressure in assembling, and remember, we're talking about a school system which until then was so divided in authority, and now Bloomberg had basically rolled it up. We're talking about 1.1 million kids at that time, somewhere about 12, 13 million, billion B dollars, and uh, maybe 130,000 employees. So this is a massive undertaking. And what you have to understand, and at this point, I was being mentored, actually, by two people who have remained friends of mine, Dick Parsons, who's on TFA board, and Jack Welsh, who most people never heard of. So they were <laughs> both sort of helping me because it was a huge amount on my plate. And it's very hard. Jack keeps telling me, he said, look, the trick to understand in leadership is hire slowly, fire quickly. Because your team and the people around you are what this is about. And one of the things I've learned about leadership is, is if you think leadership is about you, move on. It's not about you. You need a team, you need people who are gonna carry your message. I mean, one of the things I am truly proudest of, probably the thing, is a number of people from New York City during this administration, many of whom are on the stage, many like Ellen and mm -hmm. Katie are in the audience, others. These people have carried the work forward at levels that are unimaginable. You go around the country, look at people in leadership positions that came out of New York City. I always say, basically, the two pipelines for really great leadership in public education, by and large, have come out of Teach for America and the New York City Public Schools. And that's because we created a culture and a climate. And I knew that it wasn't about so much about mentoring, it was about supporting and developing our people that was critical. I learned a lot of that from the person who had appointed me, Mike Bloomberg, who had a really deep belief that the people you appoint, there are two things you have to do to them. You have to be brutally honest with them and I remember some what I used to call accountability conversation. And I'm a big accountability guy, but I'm pretty big about it when it comes to others and not so big about it when it comes to me. So <laughs> Bloomberg, Bloomberg is a big accountability guy when it comes to me. And so that, that was one thing. The other thing, and I love this about Mike, was he had your back. Because I am, I'm gonna tell you, and we'll get to the personal mentorship in a second, but. If you run an organization and you don't get people, you are in the wrong business. And the thing that Mike was wonderful about was he was brutally honest with you, he gave you discretion, wholly unafraid to hold you accountable, but he had your back. So there were, usually when I really screwed something up and he read about it because he got up before I did, he called me at about 5.30 in the morning and start to really let me know what he thought. So if you get a 5.30 phone call from Mike, <laughs> It's not, she's not asking how my family's doing. <laughs> so I get this 5.30 phone call, at least a, this one, at least a half a dozen times. And uh, he's, he gets on the phone, he said, I'm so upset this morning, I'm so angry. I said, what do I do now, Mike? My God. He said, no, no, it's not what you did. He said, Randy Weingarten's in the paper. She's saying you should be fired. He says, no, I can't even fire you if I want to. Said, that, that is a great leader. That is a great, no, but this is, you're laughing, but this is so powerful, and it made me love him so much. So there is what I call this world of professional, and it, and it wasn't just, that's why I'm so happy Paymon's here, because it was, it's mutual. If I told you all the things I learned from these people and from other people, remember, I wasn't a career educator. There were lots of people in the department who came and taught me and worked with me and helped me and mentored me. So first thing I always say to people is, Invest in your people, but understand it's a two-way street. 
That's part mentorship, part leadership, and part a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. We'll get on, because I know you want to talk about it. So I'm sort of more where Heather was, which is when I was younger and even now, I find it hard to call somebody and say, can you help me, can you mentor me, can you teach me? And you know, I've been, I've been around for a while, I still find out. Mark, he was just, he got different genes in the rest of it. He walked, he really, he walked out of his mother's womb asking people to mentor him. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of what he's about. And the reason I, I, I mean, the people before me had not done as good a job as I thought they needed, so I had to get involved personally on that. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. That is a mentor right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, Joel, you, as you said very clearly, have really mentored and developed and invested in many people um, over time. Were you conscious of this? Like, or when did you become conscious that you knew you were going to produce the next Mark Sterberg and Pamela and Heather and that Ellen and, you know, with Jamina, we could go on and, and just list the very many people that Gene you are. Gene Ravine, Dan Weiss. Exactly. So Chris were you I mean, conscious and you said, yes, this is my theory of action. I'm consciously investing. I'm going to, part of how I do this is I, I'm going to return that email to Mark. And how did you, when did this come to be? Did you all, how did you learn that? And I learned it when I started my own law firm, which was in 1980 in Washington, D.C. It was a little firm called Anna Klein and Farr. And it's just a simple theory of action that I have is that in order to do important things, you need to have people around you and you need to constantly develop them just as people develop me. I spent a year clerking in the city for Lewis Powell on the Supreme Court. And I cannot tell you how much he invested in helping all of us, there were four clerks that year, and how important, and to this day, when I face a really tough, often ethical kind of challenge, I just sit down and say to myself, what would Lewis Powell do? Mm. So getting in people's heads, being able to talk honestly, it leverages not just what you want to do, but generationally what it amounts to. And so, you know, when people get out there and they say, well, I learned this from him or I learned this from her, it's really important. And it makes you, you know, you want to build a great law firm, you got to constantly develop your people or it ain't going to happen. You want to have a great uh, sort of run like we had in New York City in, in the schools? You got to constantly develop your people, support them, give them their discretion, but develop them. And you'll find two things in that. You'll get as good as you give, I promise you. And I've always told people when it comes to mentoring, believe me, it's better for the mentor than the mentee. It really is. It's so enriching. You know what you learn from other people like that when you develop those kind of really personal relationships? And second of all, if you want to be a leader, you've got to be able to reach out in ways that you can't see. And there's only one way to do that, is through other people who embody the values, the candor, the willingness to mentor others. That's why, again, I keep fascinating on One of the great things I always think about is, you know, Paimon couldn't be my son because I was not that close to him, but he's kind of like a grandson because he's <laughs> John's son. And that's really important to me to get that <laughs> leverage to keep going. And you know, I've seen him, I did a couple of gigs with him. I, I came to Camden to meet with his team and talk to his people. And he's doing the same thing with his people. He's put together, I mean, he's a young, young guy, this guy, right? And he's putting together this amazing group of people down there. And what he's trying to do is bring in others to help them and help develop them. He's helping to develop them. He's, and so you get into that thing. And I, I will tell you now, I get calls from people who basically, the mentorship they want to know is if I can connect them up to somebody else. Now, if it's somebody I love and care about, I'll do that. But when come, somebody calls you and you barely know, and those are not people I mentor. Then I get really people who, who have studied me and are interested and want to learn more about my values, my life, the things that matter to me, and those people I will mentor. Hmm. So before I open it up for a conversation between all of us, um, I'm curious about any reflections that you have observations you've made, whether you look back and say, I wish I would have done this more, or I'm focused on doing X, Y, or Z, as it pertains to race and class and even gender. Um, you know, I actually know that it's pretty diverse, the group of people that have come under you, but any observations or thoughts that you have, reflections that could help folks in the room? Sure. I mean, I, I think, all, again, even when I would say in my own life, the people who mentored me, with a couple of exceptions, were 
men, there was a couple of women, Pat Wald, who was a judge in D.C. who mentored me, Janet Reno, when I worked for her at the Justice Department. But most of the people that mentored me were men. Most of the people I've mentored, but not all of them, were men. So I think you want to be alert to these kind of things as you think about it. I think we could have done a better job in New York City on diversity, but I'm awfully proud of the fact that I have been lucky to have diverse group of mentors. I mean, Dick Parsons, who I mentioned, Vernon Jordan, who is, when I He's went to DePaul work- He's a DePaul graduate, did you know that? Is that right? Yeah. I did not know. <laughs> when I went to work in the uh, Clinton administration, he, he was a friend of mine and mentored me throughout that whole period. And he's the perfect kind of mentor because mm -hmm. nobody ever knew about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever knew about it. Mm -hmm. So I think being alert and aware of these things, now I'm, I'm really happy about the fact that uh, the people I'm mentoring now are two young African-American men who came to me. I, I, I didn't know they existed. Uh, one was in business in New York, one was at the Harvard Business School and just called me, sort of like Mark Sternberg. I don't know where they got my phone. When I was chancellor, it, it was in every, every bathroom in the city, so, <laughs> and, but, but, so, so that's how Sternberg got it. Uh, or maybe off of New York one, I don't know. But no, I, I, and, and I think, but that'll be so much easier, I think, now. I mean, the question you asked in this room at the outset that everyone almost raised his or her hand about. It's comfortable. Was that people are much, much more comfortable. We live in a very different world now. Now, this is not your average typical room, so, but I do think that there's much more sort of, if you will, diversity in mentorship that mm -hmm. goes on. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I want to open it up to have a discussion. Hopefully you all are jotting down questions. You can bring those up as, as we start here. Um, one of the things that I would love to and now we can just have a conversation, you can react to them. You, we can do anything we want here. Um, but I wanna dive into a little bit about um, this feedback piece that, that was clearly highlighted here. The fact that you were very direct and, um, and clear about your expectations, which have been very high, and that's, that is one of your reputational things, which is incredible. Um, but clearly, in, with these folks too, you all felt like, Joel has my back. So even when he's telling me the truth about what I screwed up or what you're not meeting his expectation, um, you know that he's not, he's, you're, you're not losing confidence. Um, you're, and in fact, hopefully it's motivating you to do better and, and want to deliver. I'd love to better understand um, your, Joel, like if that's intentional, like if you, that's part of like you, how you built that, how you're able to um, have such high expectations of people yet people feel supported through that, because I think that's a balance that lots of leaders struggle with. Um, and any thoughts you all have on things that he did, he may not even realize it, that were really helpful and important um, for you all to feel validated and motivated to keep at it and, and reach higher? For me, it's stuff I've learned from others. I mean, you have to, if you want to be an effective leader, and this is as much about leadership really as mentorship, and I, I'm trying to. That's good. Sort of That's disaggregate good. a little bit the two of them. I mean, when I'm mentoring somebody in a personal way, they're not worried that I'm going to fire them as a mentee, right? But when I'm mentoring Mark, this is very hard because Mark's my deputy, and especially early on, he did a few things then and that I thought were not really where I wanted him to be. Now, the, I wasn't remotely thinking that I didn't want him to be my deputy, which is a separate question about how do you deal with people mm -hmm. who you don't think ought to be on your team. I knew he wanted, I wanted him on my team and I knew he was a great t part of the team, but there were things that I thought that he wasn't getting right. And I, I think, and he can speak in response, but I think a combination, you disrespect people if you pull your punches. You don't develop them. And I had enough respect for him to think that just because I said it didn't make it gospel. What makes it harder in the context of an employment relationship is he's afraid whether he agrees or disagrees with me that he's going to, the consequences. But I hope, and I, others can talk here, I hope I created an environment in which people felt they could say, as I've seen all my life, people say to me, well, I agree with A and B, but I think you're just wrong about it, and let's, let's talk about that. But I just find so much of feedback and discussion is, is kind of almost wrote, mm -hmm. not meaningful, mm -hmm. not really dialogue. 
and that if you get defensive, then you know it's not going to work. But I, I will tell you, to this day, I mean, I, you know, I'm almost 70 years old. I relish the fact that somebody says to me, you know, I, I just, I mean, the guy I report to now, he's 38 years old, right? I'm 70 years old. And he tells me, he said, you know, you didn't follow through on that. And I, you, you dropped your jaw, right? I mean, I, but I think it's great. And you know what? You happen to be wrong about that, but nevertheless. <laughs> no, 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 but I mean, not, he was, no, no. No, I mean, so, this is a fundamental point about organization, leadership, values. If you don't build it on integrity, mm -hmm. and integrity really means both the willingness to say to somebody something that you know they're not going to really want to hear, because most people don't like constructive criticism, and the willingness to know that because you say it, doesn't make it true. It's the beginning of a discussion. And it's critical you create an environment where no organization will succeed. And I've seen this a thousand different ways where people, the things that should be said between him and me, get said between me and somebody else. And I say, you know, Mark should have done this, this one. Just talk to each other. Let me, let me yeah. respond, if I may. Uh, both, just to, to, to analyze, you, the, the context there a little bit. As a mentor, which jo Joel is tethering out that it is sometimes hard to be a mentor to someone you're, you know, who is on your payroll. Um, and it's sometimes easier to be a mentor to someone who is not dependent on you for their performance review. I can tell you, uh, you know, f for me, this was a very rich experience. I mean, that's, that is the understate, understatement of the century. Uh, and I needed the feedback. And, and, and Joel would give it in a way that, you know, you're not going to forget the feedback when you get it. And it is, it is born out of his affection for you, but also for uh, his, his analysis of what needs to happen. Th this is in a, an environment where, and now I want to talk about Joel, the, sort of the leadership aspect of this. A cabinet meeting in the client administration was very rarely Joel slamming his fist on the table and saying, this is the path. Joel was always clear uh, about the outcomes and in, you know, wanted people around him who were prepared to think openly and creatively and, and frankly have open disagreements with each other that would generate through a dialectic there uh, the best outcome. So in a, in a scenario like that, you're gonna, you're gonna do some things well and you're gonna do some things badly. And, and the mentor leader then says, you know, g gives the sometimes gentle, sometimes not so gentle nudge back on the track. Great. Heather, do you wanna? I just have a quick, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, this weekend <laughs> overall and I, I sort of was thinking about this panel and I just feel like this whole weekend is basically about mentorship and leadership in that regard because Everyone here has been trained, supported, brought in, welcomed by um, another person. And so to that extent, like this is one big like mentorship weekend, right? Like the, the role that I think is so critical as a leader is to figure out how you find those opportunities all the time. And I don't think it's always about talking to the CEO because I think there's a lot of richness in identifying through authentic engagement and relationships and work who are the people around you, uh, laterally to you, um, that work for you or that work for the people that work for you? And then also the people in other spots that are not your direct manager in you know, sort of a, the next level up. Um, and using that sort of 360 view to figure out, well, how do I, based on my day-to-day -day work, right, build a really authentic relationship with that person and leverage that as an opportunity to both give and get feedback? Um, so I do think there's this aspect of your change and you can be changed or you are changed and you also change another person's course through those internal uh, authentic relationships. So there is a question that I think is good for us to tackle here because we do also know that um, people want access to people like you, Joel, and to frankly all of you on this panel, um, you know, people want to, to know what you think and how to, how to learn from you. So here's, a, I think, a good question. Can you make mentors from strangers? Um, everyone on the panel um, in some way had a relationship with Joel. 
However, if you identify someone you want to be your mentor that you want to learn from, but you don't know them, how do you start that process? Or is this not feasible? Does it have to come from an authentic you know, engagement? What is you all's perspective on that? It's happened to me both ways. And, and again, it's, it's kind of, you don't plan for it. About three months ago, I was at an Aspen Institute event. Mm -hmm. And somebody came up to me and said, he had been mentored by John Whitehead, and John Whitehead had said nice things about me, and he wanted to tell me that. And he said, I'd like to come talk to you about it. And from that developed, it was totally cold, and developed a real relationship, and we're now really very close, and we spend time together. Somebody else, I had a situation where a friend of mine said, I've got a young kid working for me who's off the charts but I'd really appreciate if you spent some time with him because I think he needs some time on maturity, on learning, on this and on that, and that happened there. So I, I don't think there's one pathway. The only advice I give to people, because I was always on, there's something you think about, it's presumptuous you know, to email somebody or walk up to somebody. The worst thing that's gonna happen is they say no, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the end of the world, don't take it personally, you know, but if you don't ask, then obviously no is going to be the answer. So I, I, I try to teach this a little bit, that if you feel like somehow it's some kind of rejection because somebody says, gee, I don't have the time for it, or you know, you're not important enough for me, or, this is not. It's really, I mean, and understand, busy people oftentimes just feel too busy to take something on. There's somebody I'm talking about right now about doing something who'd love to do it, but I think he may not have the time. So I, I, I think contextualize things. But the thing I try to teach people is that there's no risk in not trying, right? Just go for it. I think you can. I think that's the short of it as far as my experiences go. And I think it should be couched in how you think about what you want out of a mentorship opportunity. I have sought mentorship really out of necessity because I've been sitting here reflecting on my experiences. So when I was in New York City, I left the private sector, was working in a large bureaucracy, couldn't figure it out. And just asked the most basic questions, anyone who would listen, in the same way I did when I was a teacher and bugged the crap out of some really high-performing teachers in uh, schools throughout the tri-state area. Mm -hmm. And so then I met Mark, and I know we've kind of joked about how active he is uh, in terms of finding mentors. Uh, but it's a very, very different approach, so in terms of like concrete takeaways. And I, uh, I had a conversation with Mark recently about uh, a gentleman named Jason Camera. Some of you all may know he's the head of instructional practice here in Washington, D.C., working for Kai Henderson. And former I'm, National Teacher of the Year. Former National Teacher of the Year. And I met Jason through a fellowship I'm doing. And I mentioned it to Mark, who I think went to college with Jason. And, and Mark said, stay very close to that guy. Stay very close to that guy. I was like, wow, I just, I never think about it that way. Like Jason's like a remarkable human being. And I never really thought about it in terms of every time I see him, I need to just like pick his brain and just hear him talk, which is what I do now to the point where I think he thinks I'm a creep. Um, <laughs> he's remarkable. And there are a lot of other remarkable people clearly in our movement. Uh, and so I do think there's so much to learn from that approach to be direct, to ask the questions and to not be afraid of someone saying no or not returning an email. I mean, I'll tell you this story where I mentioned Jack Wells. So when I became chancellor, I, I, I have this deep belief that if I had one skill that was better than anybody else running the school system, I want to be the best principal picker in the world. I, if I could get a great leader at every school, I would have done something miraculous. And I did get Mark, and I'm proud of that. So I was at a dinner party just at the time when I was thinking about this and talking about what I thought, because my, my, my whole theory of change in education is at this level of the school. The school's a unit that matters. We called our reforms in New York, children first, a system of great schools, not a great school system. And all the bureaucrats and everybody, they thought that this is nuts, because they run a, the system, they don't run the school. And so everything we were about started, and if you have a bad leader, then you <coughs> cannot succeed and somebody who doesn't know how to really get the trust and support. So one of the things, even when teachers often were opposed to a lot of things I were doing, it was still fine if they thought day in and day out their lives were good because they had good leadership, they were invested, engaged, and so forth at the school. 
So this was my theory of change, and I'm at a dinner party, and lo and behold, I bump into Jack Walsh, who I didn't know at the time. And we had a drink together, we talked about schools, and you know, I said, you know, Jack, this would be really great if I could get you involved, because nobody's done more on leadership training. You've got this whole Jack Walsh Institute at Crotonville for leadership training. They identify a GE all the time, who are the future leaders of this company. They're riveted on it, focused on it. So, you know, he's talking, he says, and he had left GE at the time, and, and I told him, you know, this would burnish your image, you do something for the public schools and all of that sort of stuff. And he says, yeah, I'd like to do it. So I said, okay, I said, here's what we do. I said, when you sober up tomorrow, if you're serious about this, call me back, <laughs> and we'll go ahead. And damn, he called me back the next day. And I said to my wife when I left, I said, he's not, he's just having a few drinks and having fun at my expense. But at my expense. And, well, you know, of course, I, 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 he wanted me to think that I was gonna get the big Jack Walsh to help me. So, but, but th there's a lesson in that, and probably if I hadn't had a couple of drinks, I wouldn't ask either, but there's a lesson in that, that there really is worth giving it a mm. shot. That's good. I'm, I just I think this question follows with that, and maybe Heather, you know, you can also add to this. But it's it's directed to Mark and Joel specifically. But I think all of you can answer this. And what I'm getting from this question is, people want a little bit more, like concretely, really. So, Mark, yeah. How did you initially reach out? So we heard you wrote an email. You asked questions that, you know, no one else could answer. Like. People want to know what really did you ask? Like, give us some examples that made Joel want to say yes. And Joel, what about his reaching out compelled you to want to say yes? Let's talk. So if you all can sort of go back and if you reflect on the types of emails you get, some that you might dismiss if there's a pattern, um, or some that you pay more attention to, like what, what differentiates these things? And Mark, how, tell us a little bit more about your thinking on how you approach this. Be concrete. So sure, you want me to start? So here, when Mark Kolf, he was up there, first of all, and this is totally fortuitous, he's up at the school, which is his principal of, which is uh, a man, uh, Vanna Charles. It just so happened, like 40 years before he got there, my mother went there. So I was kind of intrigued by the place to begin with. He calls, he's telling me the stuff he's doing, he's interested. So I went up there. I mean, you, your school chancellor, you go up. So then I see the culture. I see what's happening with the kids. I talk to his teachers, and I see that they're basically enormously engaged. I'm up there, and people are talking to me about 6, 7 o'clock in the evening, and there's kids all over the place. So to me, it, it, this is fortification of my view that a great principal is really the instrumental change agent in the school system. And so now I've got somebody where I can say to anybody, Melissa, you want to see what I'm talking about? Come up with me to Havana Childs and watch what Mark and his team are doing up there. And so that became, you know, for me at that level, particularly personal. And I'll never forget, I mean, to this day, I, know, I write about it in my book. I mean, th their first grad, you know, he was a young kid. He's still a young kid. But, and I'm going to go back to another example about him just to have some fun and make some trouble. But, mm. uh, so, but he was a young, he's a young kid, and I go to his first graduation where like 96% of these kids are graduating, 92% are going, and in a school that he told you had previously had 20% grad rates. And I mean, the emotion, in, including myself, and I, you know, it was so powerful. So that made it very compelling for him. Second of all, Mark is a guy who is constantly trying to learn. And, and w w what I'll say about that is, He's not defensive. If I went up there and said, you know, this thing is working at your school, but are you really looking at this? He was not one of like so many other principals who say, ah, oh, he's the chan, what the hell does he know? If he knew anything, he'd be here where I am and move on. He was much more willing to engage and to learn. And the example I want to give is when people say, sort of, if you will, how I meant it myself. One of the issues for me about Mark, Mark's a golden boy, right? And so golden boys or golden girls, they like to be liked. And so one of the things I think, it's very hard to be an effective leader if you're too busy being liked. You create cacophony in a system. You have to be respected, you have to be a person of integrity, but you can't be overwhelmed with being liked. And one of the best series of discussions he and I ever had was about that set of issues. 
Because people, it's the old story about the rabbi who listens to the husband. The husband says everything against the wife possible. And the rabbi says to the husband, I, I've heard what you say, I agree with you. The wife then gets up and says the exact opposite of what the husband says. And the rabbi says, I've listened to you carefully uh, and everything you say I agree with. And the rabbi's student says, Rabbi, I don't get it. He says, the one said everything one way, the one said everything the other way. You agreed with both of them. They can't both be right. He says, my son, you're also right. So this, <laughs> I, I, I have seen this so, no, I, you're lying. This is to me one of the fundamental issues of leadership. People unafraid to say. I mean, we had a deal, I'll give you a great example, right? So we had a deal with Eva Moskowitz because she was opening up charters. So now Eva is, is a very whatever else, a person who asks for a lot. We wanted to support her, but we also had to be able to be prepared to say no. And when she says no, she, when you tell her no, she's not a happy camper. I mean, you know, she's gonna yell and scream. But to do your job and to serve Eva, even sometimes requires saying no. And teaching people that and having those kind of discussions to me were really amazingly amazing. Lewis Powell was so instrumental in helping me with that respect. I, he, he just really said, he said, you want to please people. So you say yes, and you don't mean yes, and you can't carry through on yes. And that's really, there's a very concrete example of where trust and candor, I think, and a willingness to not be defensive like he was. I, and I think he's a much, much better leader as a mm. result. I like that. Can I just say, delivering results, um, you willingness to learn, and it sounds like conviction is very valued by this one. Yeah, and, and when I sent that, you know, naively sent that first email to Joel, I did not imagine that, you know, several years later we'd be standing in a dark hall at Tweed with, you know, Joel, Joel the mentor teaching me, you know, to um, curb my golden boy instincts, uh, but, but boy, am I glad he did. Um, you know, what I, what I, what I, you know, just back to your original question, right? I, I, uh, you know, this was a guy who was demonstrating enormous courage, who, um, who didn't know me, uh, who, uh, who, on whom I was dependent, uh, who I needed to know, and who, from whom I knew I would draw enormous strength. It was not uh, it was not transactional, and it was not much more complicated than that. And uh, y you know, c certainly a very high return on and you know on that that email sent. But again, like Joel, Joel did the hard work here. I'm gonna just jump in for a second. Yes. I, I think the question was direct. Like most of the people in the room are really looking for this concrete advice, right? And so I think that means most people in the room are not like totally confident or uh, clear about the ways to do that. Um, and this is one style, right, that, that worked. Um, I think an alternate style would rely on a bunch of different things. And I'll just be really clear about the framing of this. Like when I said I didn't know how to do this, um, I just wasn't looking at the cues around me. Um, and I actually had this belief around just, if you just work hard, people will notice you, right? Like it's a very common gender, social identity rooted kind of feeling, right, that happens. Um, and it worked for most of my life, right? And then I was then on a much bigger stage at scale and I had to figure out a different game. Um, and I really did learn a lot about that in business school and I uh, started a whole sales program because we didn't have it at MIT. And it was all about the cold call. Um, and it was all about how do you make that first introduction to people. And very practically, we had a model that was why you, so when you reach out to someone, like why is that person interesting to you? Um, why now? Why am I reaching out to you now? And like, What's the call to action? So, you know, if I was trying to reach out to Joel now, in my 40-year-old self, I'd say, Joel, I read, read your book. <laughs> um, I loved it. I really want to learn more about systems change because I want to be a superintendent someday. Um, and so the call to action right now would then be, hey, like, I'm actually going to maybe put my hat in the ring for, I don't know, Providence Public Schools, for example. And then I would say, can you, can you talk to me about it? Right? How do I navigate that? So like, that's sort of like a very concrete arc that one can follow where they sort of reach out to people to really compel them to, to respond back. Um, and I think it's also about the both and. I mean, some of the things that I deliberately do, I mean, people are super busy. Um, and e like an executive director has tons of people that they're working with and there are um, ways that which you can also reach out to them. But as I view my role also in reaching out to everyone equally, 
uh, this aspect of I call every single, you know, when I was an executive director, I called every single core member that came into my core. And I literally said to them, put my number in your phone because that, this is a lifelong journey through Teach for America, and it's not just about your two-year commitment, but when I call you in five years to congratulate you on that thing that I saw on the news that you just did that was awesome, like I want you to know it's me calling you, and I want you to pick up the phone. Um, and then I always say, like, and then also you need to have my number on your phone in case you need something. Like I'm not your coach, you know, directly, but I want you to reach out to me if you're having a problem, or if you want a thought partner, or if I can be of help in any way. Um, and I really think that's important. And I think those cues, people don't always take them up, right? Like, I probably wouldn't have taken that cue when I was 25, but I take that cue now. If someone says, hey, reach out to me, I do. So making yourself more aware and embracing the confidence to do that, I think is really important. Great. I'm gonna ask another question here, which is a fun one, or interesting at least. I don't know if you'll find it interesting, Joel, but um, it says, uh, and this is to our panelists, can you speak to any potential pitfalls of having a mentor who, although influential, may also be a controversial figure in the policy, politics, and or practice of education? It's a great question. It doesn't apply to me. But no, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's all a, you know, people are just wondering if they ever run into the situation, what might they do? Sort of like when your, your old boss is running the Walton Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that there's a great answer to this. Uh, I mean, Joel talks about his pool of mentors, emphasis on the word pool. Like, you know, this is not a, a one-trick pony thing. Um, so you want to you wanna reach out to folks who are going to push you and, and inspire you. And, and I think, uh, you know, a diverse, a diverse set of people who are across the spectrum is probably wise, but intensely personal. Um, you know, intensely depends on who you are, where you are in your life, and I don't know that there's, there's a right or wrong here. Yeah, I don't have a great, let me put it this way, I think that's a really involved question that deserves a really involved answer that you're probably not going to get from us on the stage right this minute. I immediately thought to what Kira Orne Jones said earlier today, for those of you that were at her session actually with you, Joel, and when she was first running for Bessie in Louisiana, she was working on her stump speech and said it, her campaign manager heard it out and called out the fact that she didn't mention that she's executive director of Teach for America. And she was so nervous about pointing that out in her stump speech. And so she basically, like, to make a long story short, talks about bridging identities and how uh, it's so important to own this work, knowing it's hard to do that, knowing this work is complicated, knowing that we're evolving as a movement. And so, yeah, it's super involved, and I struggle with this in Camden. There, it's a city that is still grappling with decades of institutional racism and so many, so many other issues that are born out of that. And so when you get associated with the Broad Foundation, uh, which I'm a, uh, uh, doing a fellowship there, when you get associated with New York City reforms and the Walton Foundation, people jump to certain conclusions, and I think that whether it's a mentor or whether it's an institutional relationship, I just so appreciate what Kira said earlier, which is you, you own it, you acknowledge it, you put it out there, you have a conversation about it. I think there's, there's two ways to look at it. I think it's a terrific question, and I'm not the least bit defensive. When you engage in a mentorship or a relationship with people, it doesn't mean that they are gonna end up sort of with your style and your way. I mean, one of the things you gotta understand, this is, these are their own people. I mean, these three people in many ways are very different. Paymon, and I've watched him, and I, I think he's doing brilliant, brilliant work, but he's trying to keep the volume down. I kept the volume loud in New York, and I, was, no, I, and I think that's a product of both different styles, different circumstances, but I respect the fact that people will engage in different ways, and that's, to me, actually a positive, not a negative. Mm -hmm. There is a second and practical level, which I'm also okay with, which is somebody's you know, applying for a job and th they may want to be more similar to me, but you know, since I am somewhat controversial, somebody says to him, well, you know, you came from New York, you trained under Joel Klein, he's highly controversial, are you gonna be very controversial as well? And I think it's perfectly fair to say, I'm not Joel Klein, or you know, to create enough distance in, in what you're doing. So I, I don't look at that as a, as a negative 
at all. That's just sort of reality in some respects. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that 100%. And not only is it reality, but you should embrace it because it's part of who you are. Um, and there's no, you know, knowing your own story and knowing how that influenced who you are, both in, in good ways and also what you learned, you know, from some of the ways that maybe weren't your preferred style, I think are really critical. Um, you know, to that question of like your affiliation with Teach for America, just, just own it. I mean, I had an experience where I ran for public office and um, I was particularly scared, or, or I had a fear, right, in my sort of deep recess of my mind, that I would be, um, you know, uh, hit, you know, publicly by my affiliation with Teach for America, which has been a predominant part of my career, and then working for, you know, Joel Klein at the Department of Education. But I just got ahead of it. You just have to say, this is who I am, and I'm unapologetic about it, and these are my values, and this is why I care about the issue. Um, and that, I think, is more powerful to basically head something off at the past, so to speak, and, and just own that. I love those answers. I just think that is at the core of leadership, is knowing what your convictions are, which you learn from so many people around you. And I actually think having mentors and people around you who think differently than you and maybe may be controversial <laughs> is good because it helps provide different dimensions to your thinking and your own development. Um, so what is the difference between being a great manager and a great mentor? It's the same. I mean, in my mind, being a great manager of other people, you're managing their development, their thought process, um, their confidence. I think it's all in the same. Yeah, and I, I think it's, um, I mean, Joel should respond to this. I mean, my experience as a mentor and as a manager is that it is often easier to be one and not the other. Uh, that, that the degree of difficulty uh, of mentoring when you are also holding that person accountable for you know, getting things done and getting hard things done is, is higher. Um, yeah, Joel, you want to respond? Good. I think a lot about the difference between leadership and management. Sure. And so I think leaders are consumed with a better future and that's all they think about and, that's, and they're communicating that vision to the rest of their team. I think great managers put their direct reports in a position to be successful to deliver on that vision, to deliver on the goals attached to that vision. And I think that's the same with mentorship. So we do uh, twice a year a Gallup Q12 survey, really simple survey, 12 questions. And two questions that I pay a lot of attention to is, do I know what is expected of me? So I think great managers set expectations. And then the other question, and I think this is one of the implicit things I've learned from Joel, is does my manager care about me? And I, I, I always jump to those two questions and feel grateful that my team has given me all fives on does my manager care about me? Because set high expectations, hold them accountable, but show that you care, and I think that's exactly what mentorship is. I, I think Payvon has nailed it. I, I think the really dispositive question is the difference between leadership and management. Lots has been written on it, and fundamentally, you need both, but great management without leadership is fundamentally an organization that's well run but going no place. Great leadership without effective management is an organization with a vision and nothing else. Michael Barber used to always say to me, the road to school reform is littered with great ideas poorly executed. You can have the greatest vision and the greatest ideas, but if you don't get the blocking and tackling and execution done, it isn't going to work. And part of management, not the only part, is management of human capital. Real candid feedback, constant development, constant openness to hear back from people. But there's also simply getting things done, holding people accountable, making sure. First year when we did all the changes in New York City for children and we opened up the schools, it was a mess. I mean, things got f fell through the cracks. We forgot to open up the right number of centers for this or that. We paid a huge price for it. The second year, we started in June for an implementation in September and our systems were in place. So anyone who wants to run great organizations, you don't have to have it all in one person. I mean, you can have a visionary leader who has a great operator working side by side with him or her. And indeed, one of the really interesting questions, something I've thought a lot about in my own experiences, how many number twos, meaning the deputy of this person, go on to be effective number ones? Because those are different skill sets. And how many chief operating officers can end up being CEOs or even chief financial officers? So I, I think a lot about those, but I'll tell you, if you don't have the full package, it doesn't matter. 
so much of what's wrong with school reform has been great visionary leaders with no concrete execution on the mm. ground, none. Mm. Yep, very helpful. Um, Jill Klein, Michelle Ree, Cami Anderson, are these larger than life role models that have achieved systemic change. What, it, what would it look like to achieve this as a grassroots collective or from the bottoms up? So I actually think the change that we achieved in New York, and I can't tell, uh, talk for Cami or Michelle, although they are two people I respect enormously. The change we created in New York, I really believe, was from the bottom up. That model I talked about, about empowering principals, opening up charter schools, I mean, it's two things that really worked best in New York were the whole sort of small high school movement where we must open up 350 of these high schools over the time we were there. And they all, th those were in effect public schools that were totally charterized. What I mean by that, we had this pipeline process. We had a team of people, Michelle Cahill, Kristen Kane. They would meet with 150 different people. Some of them would be people at KIPP or Uncommon or Achievement First. Others would be people like Mark or others who had a vision. And whether they wanted to do a traditional public or a charter, I didn't care about. That I didn't care about. That was their politics, their style, their life. What I wanted them to do is a great school. And I opened up as many of them as I could, and then I let them differentiate. And so Mark ran his school, had different things going on. So in that respect, I think it is grassroots. What I think is nuts about K-12 is this deep belief, which is permeates the culture, is the reason you're at the top. You're one of the top people in the organization must be that you're smarter or more knowledgeable or more competent than the other people, and so you can figure out from Tweed how to run 1,500 schools. The odds of that happening are absolutely zero, and yet you see it time and time again. So to me, create conditions in which bottoms-up change can take place. If you go to New York, there was an article in the paper about this. I didn't generate the article, only about two, three weeks ago. The head of the principal's union, who was not my largest fan, although we had a very good close personal relationship, but in, and that's an important point to make that there. Somebody mentioned it. Whatever disagreements you have, keep them about the issues, not about the people. Keep them about the issues. And Ernie Logan and I really had a, a good personal friendship. I admire him to this day. But politically, we had some tough issues to work through. And recently, the thing that he said in New York was that basically his principles feel that they're being micromanaged from Tweed, that, that won't work, it can't work. It's not about my view versus, it just can't work. And so when you think about this top down, bottoms up, people at the top can only do one thing really well, is create the conditions so that people who are running the schools can create the work that you need. But if you try to run schools from a bureaucracy, it won't work. So I, think about it from a slightly different angle because of the seat I sit in in Camden and how there is a very palpable sense of disenfranchisement in our community. Uh, democratic structures have been stripped away for a very long time, so the state operates. Uh, uh, the fiscal controls in City Hall, they took over, the county took over the police department, and then not too long ago, the governor took over the school districts. So I was the latest manifestation of, of all that. And so I say that to say there's a really important responsibility to ensure that we are building capacity at the grassroots, to ensure that we are tapping into our privilege to lift our local community up, while also recognizing that there's nothing more disenfranchising than a student who doesn't graduate from high school, and there's a necessity in the work that we're doing to reform the school district. And so to do those things in a parallel process is a high wire act. It is really complicated really hard, and just to, I guess, be concrete about how we're doing it, this is one small step we've taken, but recently I had the opportunity to hire for a chief academic officer, which is obviously a big job for us, and could have gone basically one of two ways. Brought in a clone of Paul Bambrick, if such a thing exists, he's a pretty remarkable human being, or promote from within and start to build our capacity and position someone to take over locally and hand the reins back to the local community uh, once my time is up. We took the latter route, knowing that it would be so much harder. 
And if Katrina, our current deputy superintendent, and she is like the most popular person in all of Camden, it is remarkable. She's, Katrina McCombs is her name, she's our chief academic officer, she was born and raised in Camden. Um, but she will tell you, she has a lot of growing and developing to do. And so um, it's just really messy in that regard. And I just think it's important to kind of acknowledge those realities um, to, yeah, to address the question. I don't, I, don't have, I don't have much to add, except that I think both Joel and Paymon in, in disagreeing with each other slightly are correct. You know, and, and I actually think, Joel, you would agree that, that uh, like your, obviously I, I abide by the same theory of change, but that, that, that a critique of our, you know, the, the Bloomberg journey was that we were not as assertive and engaging directly with the grassroots as, uh, as Paymon describes. And I think Paymon would agree that engaging directly with the grassroots in ways that you describe is in and of itself, absent serious changes to government and how, how government's behaving, not enough. So, so uh, uh, yes, in the, right, in the right quotient, depending on exactly what's happening in a context and, and the way a leader can, can execute. Well, I, I think it's, I've, I've said this, I think it's a fair criticism of what we did in New York, that we were not as effective as we should have been in connecting with the grassroots. I think Camden's a very different environment. It's obviously much smaller. And one of the things I always felt was the, the first connection with the grassroots, the most immediate point, was to create options for people whose kids were in dead-end schools. And so opening up six, 700 schools of choice, none of those schools were schools you had to go to. For in virtually all of them were in minority communities for children of color. I think that is one of the most empowering acts at the grassroots level for kids. But having said that, two of the failures, Jim Liebman really was tough on me, who is my chief account accountability officer, that we didn't do as good a job, or we didn't do a good job, period with respect to engaging communities, bringing them into the process, listening well to them. And, and I think that's a fair criticism. I just want to quickly say that, so Joel often pulls a group of us together to kind of reflect on how we're doing as a movement. And it speaks to his role as a mentor. It speaks to him being the greatest leader I've ever been around. Because look, hindsight is 2020. We're having this conversation in Camden with our leadership team because of what we learned in New York City, because of the conversations we've had. And one of the first things Joel told me was, build more allies, get out there. It's something I wish I would have done more of. And so uh, it, it takes a lot to acknowledge that. And I'm just so grateful for those conversations and the fact that we do have the benefit of hindsight. Well, and I, what I love about it too is Joel talks about really um, valuing when people are wanting to learn. And I think it's very, great to hear you reflect on the things that obviously have gone really, did, and you did very well in the places where we need to improve and, and being able to do that publicly, I think is incredible. So I wanna take us to, to another topic and we're gonna have to wrap up soon here, but um, I wanna talk about uh, gender, like the gender inequity that exists in our power structures as well as with amongst people of color. Um, so. 27% of uh, all superintendents are women and 11% are people of color. Um, and so I want to hear thoughts from you all as we work to ensure that, you know, and the fact is that the majority of our children in public schools are kids of color, um, and this really matters too. How do you all think about that question as you think about, I mean, you're in a position to now pay on of, you know, like what are the next generation of leaders and we're all responsible for, for that. Um, would love to just hear a little bit about, you know, whether it's something we're working on now, things we've done well, concrete best practices on this, or things that we need to be pushing ourselves to do better and how you might be doing that as we reflect on the fact that we need to make sure there are more women, we need to make sure there are more people of color in these leadership roles. And access is a real, is a real question. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I mean, I think there are a couple of things that I think a lot about with this, because it's clearly a, an issue, right? I mean, we've had a greater number of women in particular 
um, taking superintendent roles in the past decade, and the data shows that, but it's still not enough, and it's not, it's completely inverted to like who's in the, t in the classroom and teaching, right? And so I think there's these things that we just have to completely undo and, and, and true acknowledgement of the fact that our system is not set up and the current leadership is not equipped with the ability to truly build diverse teams. And I don't say that as a judgment, I don't say that as a knock on the door saying we have to all change an indictment kind of thing, but I am saying it like we all really need to deeply reflect on that and then take action um, because it's, it's a challenge. And so in thinking about these experiences, I mean, I'm, I'm an Asian American, Pacific Islander, Chinese American, I've shared that already on this panel, but um, I can tell you that for a long time I didn't talk about it and I started to talk a lot about it more when I recognized that I was in a position of privilege through um, being an executive director and a leader at scale in a community. And so I didn't have to think about it when I was an individual working for someone else, but I really had to force myself outside that comfort zone to think about what that meant. And there's both these little ways that you signal to other people in terms of what you do and how you do it, which we have to be ever mindful of, not in the like obsessive way, but certainly like in the I have blind spots way. And then also figure out ways to carve out that space and time for other people who might have, be struggling with those questions themselves to talk about it. Um, I can share a couple of examples very concretely as I think about my role as a leader and manager and mentor all in one, which is taking out all of my Asian American Pacific Islander colleagues in, in, you know, in Rhode Island in this particular uh, instance and having that space. Saying, what does it mean for you to be a teacher right, uh, of Asian American Pacific Islander background for a majority of kids who are black or Latino? Um, and how does your culture play into that? And what do your parents think about the fact that you're teaching? And having up that real space to talk about that often unlocks all these things that we have kept suppressed or silent about because it's just not something people have talked about before. And the breakthrough that comes from that is very powerful, enables people to really achieve different things once they're aware of the role that they can play um, as a teacher and then as a leader um, in various ways. Um, so I think a lot about my role in doing that and I also think about the fact that you can use that as a way to seek mentorship too. In finding people of similar background to say, hey, how have you handled this particular situation or here's what I'm thinking. Um, and I also think it's powerful, obviously, to do it along lines of difference because you can learn, you know, as we've talked about, from very diverse folks um, as well. But um, I think it's a challenge. Uh, you got to find your network of supporters, and, and those people become your champions along the way. Um, and you got to continue to follow up with them. I think um, people, I, a couple of people that I work with closely um, in the past have, have managed or worked with as a core member in this room, and um, staying in touch and that execution, you know, really making that time to reach back out to people and keeping that open line of communication is really critical too. But I'm actually curious to hear from each of you yeah. because <laughs> I, you know, cause as, as men um, in particular about the shared identity, like what are your blind spots? How do you think about that in relationship to who you are as a person? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 love, I love your answer to the question. Um, and to me, I can answer it sort of personally and then professionally. Um, in both instances, I come from enormous privilege. Um, you know, w when I think about the circle of people who I would I would call I would who I hope would call me a mentor, um, you know, I think I think this is about probably holding myself accountable for uh, broadening that circle and thinking explicitly about how I'm devoting my time and and would do well by myself and by them to do to do more for more people. And thinking explicitly, Alyssa, about the dimensions you're talking about. Um, professionally, you know, I, I run a I run a foundation that that's you know giving out 200 million dollars a year, and I can tell you that we think about this question every single day. I mean, we, the heart of what we do is make grants, and the heart of grant making is an investment in people uh, and leaders. And the reality is that uh, we have work to do, Walton and the entire complex of, of funders uh, doing this work and, and doing philanthropic work generally. And, um, and this is a real conversation internally. Uh, and and I, I think it's, it is about doing it because it's the right thing. I think it's also doing it because, uh, and, and with explicit accountabilities, because in the long run, it is what is going to be best for communities and for work, uh, the work that we do. So, that is my attempt at an answer, um, and I'm sure the gentleman to my right will, will 
build on that. Yeah, to, to build on that, my blind spot is that this work, what we're talking about, doesn't come instinctively to me. And so we try to create systems. And this may sound like the most obvious thing in the world, but it's one thing just to talk about diversity, to talk about access, to talk about mentorship. It's another thing to actually codify those things as goals that you measure. And so when we look at new hires, we're always looking at it through the lens of what are the demographics of our new hires pre-state takeover, post-state takeover? Uh, what does it look like in terms of the year's experience between the two? Uh, just constantly looking at our demographics, constantly asking ourselves, are we promoting in an equitable fashion? So just looking at data helps <laughs> for starters. And so to take that point a little bit further and to really acknowledge some of the incredible work that was happening in New York City under Joel. When you're systemic about it, you do things like, in New York City, they had a Chancellor's Fellowship, which was intended as a, as a mentorship opportunity for those that really weren't in the inner circle, that weren't as fortunate as I was to kind of get plucked out in many respects. And, and so to the extent you can be systematic, especially when you realize it's a blind spot of yours, uh, as it is for me, um, and so I just thought it was really neat how in New York there were real resources devoted. Joel would take time out of his day to meet with the fellows. And again, these were people that wouldn't have otherwise had that opportunity in the same way that I think some of our policies are starting to see that traction um, in Canada. Well, I, I think, you know, Heather, Heather makes the, the key point. And, you know, I'm not just a white guy. I'm an old white guy. So I, I've got a lot of blind spots. So, it's, you know, I was thinking about this when the question was asked. When I started Harvard Law School in 19... 67, it's about 650 people in my class, 26 were women. I mean, so that's an environment which entirely different. I mean, if you went up there today, more than half the people would be women. So it's just, uh, what I find in life is trying to be honest about your blind spots. I think we did a decent, not a great job on diversity in New York. Some really strong leaders like Marshall Isles, who's part of our team now in Jersey City, J.C. Broussard, and even Carmen Farina, who's now the chancellor in New York, was my deputy chancellor. So there were people on the inner team. There were a lot of women. I mean, really, <coughs> Michelle Cahill, Kristen Kane. And what I found is, despite your networks and your friends, in life, nothing propinks like propinquity. Working closely with people is a way to disarm some of your own blind spots. So doing what Paymon says, and really holding yourself to account. In other words, if this is what I expect my team you know, to look like, then if you don't achieve it, that's your bad, and owning it for your bad. Once you get it, then I think this notion of propinquity, working closely, I find, and I'm sure, Alyssa, you find this at TFA, when you get in that environment that the issues that you're working on so frantically, and they're so large and so powerful and so important, that becomes so much more than what's going on than whether you, you know, have Mexican-American background and I have, you know, my thing and this thing. And so th at that point, it knits you almost as if you hadn't expected it because you're working on larger things. But in order to get there, you've got to do what Paymon said and hold yourself to account for the team that you put together, the, the backgrounds and so forth. Great. We are going to do a final round, final question. Final question is, you, we discussed a lot. Um, so I don't know what is on your mind right now, but the question that these folks want to know is final advice on finding a great mentor. What is the one thing you would tell these folks um, as they seek out folks that are going to help them in their own life and professional journey? Let me say, the first thing I would tell you is if you're trying to find a mentor because you want them to help you get a job or something like that, don't do it. It's just not worth doing. If you want to find a mentor to really develop and learn and have the kind of honest, authentic relationship, then I think that's the prerequisite. Second thing is think really hard about someone whom you respect and who you think has the values because mentorships that are not built on values are not going to be very meaningful. If they're built on opportunity, they're trivial. And then I would say what we said before, don't be afraid to ask. There's an apoc probably apocryphal story about Winston Churchill that I love, but right after the Second World War, 
he presented this enormously important award to a soldier who had done one of the most brave, heroic things imaginable. And they're sitting backstage before the event, and there's sort of this awkward silence. And at one point, Churchill says to the soldier, he says, I'm just curious why it is we're sitting here in silence as we wait to go out. And the young kid says, oh my God, Mr. Prime Minister, what would someone like me have to say to the Prime Minister of England? Yeah. And Churchill looked at him and he said, you know, I've got the same problem. What would someone like me have to say to the most heroic young man I've mm. met in my whole life? And so in that simple under misunderstanding, I think so much goes on. So what I try to tell people is just ask. And don't take it personally if it don't happen. I love that. Isn't that a wonderful story? I love, I love that. that story. My hiring process in Camden, uh, this is going to answer the question, but I was, I was hired and then put into the job a week later. I was given the offer, put in the job a week later. I had no team, no support, nothing. Platooned into a city I'd never stepped foot into with a really complicated kind of political environment. I survived those first 100 days or so because of the mentors I had. Mark, John White, Ryan Hill, a number of others that basically almost daily we were on the phone and I was just asking them, do I put my left foot in the front of the right foot and then, and then what do I do? And to answer that question, I was so fortunate to be at that point because I didn't really overcomplicate the mentorship process. I was deliberate with the people who I surrounded myself with, but it was just a constant dialogue. I was just always asking questions. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And I think that ultimately they were there for me because they appreciated that dialogue. They saw that there was a real need uh, for me and that you know that dialogue hopefully in turn benefited them. So just maintain a constant dialogue, ask questions, don't be rigid about it. Yeah, and, and nothing terribly new here. Uh, you know, you're hearing the right, the right themes, I think. A, a, it's a long game. Like, we, we were there for Paymon because we had been there for Paymon for a decade. And this is a guy we loved and, and we were excited for and walking into a tough spot. And so Ryan and Dan and John and I were happy. I mean, I mean, honored to, you know, to, to set aside other responsibilities and get in a room for the most important thing that our, our guy, Paymon, was going to do in his life. So it's, it's a long game sustained over time it is not an episodic episode you know uh, exercise it is it is it is developing a relationship with someone who um, who you trust from whom you are not asking you know the transactional question you know fr from whom you are seeking counsel and courage and um, and the things that that you can't get from other people Um, so I've got two thoughts in addition to what's been said already. Um, I think this is very big on my mind and obviously I've been making all comments about this as I was preparing but also um, executing here. Uh, diversity is, is so critical. I mean, we're not going to get anywhere fast if we don't have really strong diverse leaders at all levels of our systems challenging the status quo and fighting for kids. And so mentorship in my mind is about both a two-way street of both creating access for others to ensure that there is a diverse group of people that are living into their potential and contributingly at their full capacity, but also being able to find those diverse voices to help you as well. So a really strong example that um, was said to me at one point in the topic of mentorship was uh, thinking about it as a ladder. And I don't mean the ladder in terms of climbing the corporate world per se, I mean it in terms of the ladder of impact. And thinking through, as you continue to step up different rungs in your ladder of impact, who is helping you climb that ladder? And then who are you pulling up with you? And I think that that who is a really important thing to keep in mind because every single person in this room is a mentor to someone else in addition to someone who needs that thought partnership from someone to help them through hard times. And we will never get there, not only without the diversity of great people at all levels, but we also need each other to really be supported in those tough fights, but also to be there for the wins. Great, I'm gonna say one thing, which is we've been talking a lot about, you know, you all trying to find mentors, and it's a little bit to what you said, Heather. I think we all, we're all in a position of privilege, every single person in this room. And we have a responsibility to make sure that we are 
mentoring the next generation, whatever that looks like. And I also find that when you find yourself mentoring, you learn so much about yourself. Um, and it's an opportunity to reflect and even solidify your own values and you see yourself growing or finding like, you know what, what do I really think about that? And, and it helps, also helps you with your mentors and seeking how you're trying to sort of get to your next level of leadership. And so I just think it's a responsibility we all have not only to you know, find those people that are gonna help us, but also do that for the next generation, every single person, no matter what your role is. Um, so can you all help me in thanking this awesome group of people for being with us? I do wanna, I do wanna give a special thanks to Joel, who really is a hero to so many people. And I know, you know, he has just shown incredible courage over the years and I, I know has just shaped so many folks to learn from the great things that there are to learn from New York, help us reflect on the things that we can all do better. No matter what, no matter what you think, it really just has propelled us forward in so many ways. And so I appreciate your reflections and we are just so grateful that you joined us Thank today, you. Joel. Thank you.